Hello, I'm your host Brandon Town and this is Art in the Digital World. This show we have different people of different professions who are artists and because of the modern world they're probably doing something with computers or technology and uh, you know maybe not. We had, we had one painter on the show but most people are uh, doing something with digital effects or digital components to what they do. And so uh, this week we have Marianne Kermy. Thank you very much for being on the show. Thank you for asking me. So um, tell me what it is exactly that you do. I know that's kind of a big question, but. <laughs> it is, um, it's a voiceover. I do voiceover um, acting or voiceover talent, they call it. I've heard it um, called many different things. Um, people typically just say, oh, you do voiceovers. So um, I've been doing it for several years and loving it. You know, it was funny because um, when Susan, one of the producers, at, told me about it and she said you did voiceover, you know, I immediately was thinking, oh, she does cartoons. But then I thought, you know, knowing this industry, there is a lot of different things you can do with voiceover. So, there really is. Yeah. So maybe you could tell me a little about some of the different things that you do. Well, whatever anyone will pay for. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, you audition mostly and um, hopefully get the jobs. Um, so, yes, I've done um, animation. In fact, there was one called, um, I actually saw it in a magazine, in a, in a pretty good periodical. Um, it was called Doubt Sourcing. And it was a little bit racier than a Simpsons. Um, it was called Doubt Sourcing. It was um, out of India. And I got hired. They didn't, they, they didn't have a lot of money or a big budget, but it was really fun. It was my very first animation. Then the next job that, um, that I actually was able to, to conquer was to do voiceovers for a stuffed animal. And um, it was going to be coming out at, at Christmas time. And so he wanted um, very, very contrasting sounds. Hi, I'm Minty the Candy Cane. And um, so there was, uh, you know, a candy cane, a reindeer, a, a, all these stuffed animals. And so, um, so I guess when the child presses the, you know, the belly of the star on the Christmas tree, it would have the voice. It's amazing to think about that stuff. You don't think, you know, you get that stuff. And you, if you're not in the industry, you don't really think about where it comes from. But there's someone that has to do that. Someone exactly. has to do the voice for that exactly. stuff. Exactly. So. And you're absolutely right. You never think about where it, that somebody sat in a studio somewhere putting that voice to it. And you said that uh, earlier you were saying that you do video, you've done some video games too. Um, I don't know that I have been hired for them. I've put out auditions. Sometimes it's kind of tricky because um, there's something called a watermark that you can put when you send your audition out. And I don't like to do it um, because it will, to me, it's, you're not giving the pure voice. Um, and it kind of will make a mm, under your voice. So that way, what you're doing that for is so that the person can't use it. Um, because a lot of times they'll send you the copy that has exactly what they're going to put in their video game. Right. Now, if they were dishonest, they could use the voice and never pay you for it. Um, but that's why a lot of people put a, um, a watermark or put music under it. And I tend to not do that. I just feel like what's fair is fair. If they want to hear my voice and if they want to hire me, I'm going to keep my fingers crossed that they're going to be honest and I'm not going to walk into a Shaky's Pizza Parlor and hear my voice on a video game somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I think they do this. The, the watermark is the same thing with the picture. You know, they'll put a big graphic over the picture so you can't, you can see what the picture is, but then, you know, you can't really use it because there's some graphic that exactly. covers it. Exactly. So. Exactly. Well, now, you said you did something for India. How did you go about doing that? Did you go to India or were you able to do it all here? Or That is the most wonderful thing about the digital world. Everything now um, goes back and forth with an MP3, you know, in the snap of a finger. Um, no, I got that job through a friend. Um, I have a very good friend who his sole job is voiceovers. Um, and he's unbelievable. He can do many, many, many different voices and um, sound effects. He's, he's, he's quite good, um, John Bell. Used to work up here, in fact, and now he's gone back to um, Alabama. He, um, he knows a lot of people, and he gets a lot of great jobs. And when 
people know people usually, you know, they'll say, oh, do you have a, a female that could do this scene with you? Um, many times he'll call me or shoot me an email and say, Marianne, if you, um, if you could get this, you know, recorded and sent back to me right quick, you might get this job. He has given me many jobs. Um, some, I hate to say, I hope John's not watching, real boring jobs. I mean, there is this, um, there is this voiceover job that is pages and pages and pages of copy. And it's something that I learned a lot about. I didn't know anything about. And it was uh, medical. It is for somebody who, let's say, has all of a sudden um, their child has developed diabetes. And the parents don't know anything about it. They would get a tutorial to take home. And someone has to record that tutorial. So um, I've done those, which, you know, I'm looking at going, oh, my goodness gracious. What are they and looking up words? And thank goodness there's a dictionary that has pronunciations. Um, so to answer your question, no, I didn't go to India. Um, everything is done. I have a great job right now that is ongoing. I've done for almost two years. If you called just about any YMCA, in the country, you'll hear my voice. Oh, because of uh, the phone. You do the phone I do the, I do their on-hold um, voiceovers. Um, and it's, uh, it's been an ongoing, fantastic job. Do you do the voices of the, like, press one for this, press two for that? Is I've that... gotten many of those jobs. Yeah. Um, and those are, those are pretty easy, yeah. you know. Um, and, and sometimes you get people who want... Um, comedic ones of those, <laughs> which is good that's, for their own home oh, or something. That's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but, but the YMCA has been true blue and sending me copy. I would say every week I get several pages that, again, I just put on an MP3, shoot to them, and all of a sudden my voice, and it could be within hours, my voice could be in um, New York at the YMCA in New York. Wow. Very cool. Now, when you do those kind of jobs, how do you communicate with those people? I mean, do you use email? Do you use video chat? Do you, you know, what kind of things do you do for that? It is all email. I have never met the man that hired me. Um, I have no idea what he looks like. It's really kind of weird. Hmm. And the very first time, he sent me some copy that um, I think I was either going out of town or something, and I thought, uh-oh, I better let him know. I had just gotten these emails, and I... Um, and I called him because I knew I wasn't going to be able to be near a microphone. And I didn't know what his turnaround time needed to be. So I called him. And he answered the phone. And I said, hi, Steve. This is Marianne Kermy from Sonora. Um, and he goes, hello. And I go, your voiceover talent for the YMCA? And he goes, oh. And it was really weird for him to talk live to me and me to talk live to him. It was like, we have had this relationship of sorts for a long time and we've never it's very yeah bizarre interesting very bizarre. and it'd be interesting i'd love to call him up or something and try to hear your voice and hear the difference now that I <laughs> oh honey the weirdest thing is one time i called one of them because i didn't know the pronunciation of a um i think they were going to have a fundraiser at um at some park or something so i called the place to find out how do you pronounce the name of the park she said you know what i'm new here let me put you on hold. I was listening to me. <laughs> That's so How funny. goofy is that? Yeah. Well, um, let me back up a little bit. How did you get into this uh, business? Working at the radio station, um, it was sort of a natural progression to, um, because I think a lot of DJs do step over into voiceover acting. Um, but I also have 30 years of regular acting under my belt. Um, and so I think that really, really helped. I don't know if I was just a DJ, um, whether I would have, could have, or even wanted to, or whether I'd be uh, anywhere near as, as good, not to sound uh, immodest, but um, you know what I mean? Because I think acting has really helped pave a way or make a foundation so that I'm not nervous in front of the microphone. But the person who gave me the you better do it. You got to do it. Is John Bell again, my friend John. That's great. Yeah. And did he kind of 
recognize your voice and say, hey, you should try voice acting? Or w w were you kind of interested in it a little bit? Or Well, we both worked at Clark Broadcasting um, Radio Station in Sonora. And um, as soon as I met him, I thought, you're a great type. I do a lot of uh, theater, and I'd love for you to audition at least. Just audition. And he said, I'd love to. So he came. He auditioned. He got cast immediately um, and got cast in several other shows, one after another. We just went, oh, it's so good to have somebody that age and that versatile. Um, and he said, in turn, well, you know, Marianne, you kind of pulled me in a direction that I'm having such a wonderful time, and I never would have done this without you. Now I'm going to tell you, knowing you as I do, and after I had directed him in a play, he said, you'd be great in doing this. So it took me several months to actually say, yeah, I mean, because, you know, there's money. You have to buy into agencies and, you know, if you want work. Right, right. Now, um, what, what's your history with acting? Did you go to school or were you acting in school plays or? <laughs> um, growing up in a Maltese family with all sisters, five sisters, one brother, gave me all the history I needed as far as background. <laughs> um, but um, went, to, uh, went to college um, just for, I mean, the thing is, once I went to college for, reg, you know, just to get my general ed out of the way, I took one drama class for fun, realized, yikes, I really like this. And then you're rehearsing at night and there's no time for homework for any of the other classes. And so unfortunately, um, I didn't keep going, you know, um, to regular, or keep taking regular classes. I ended up falling in love with theater and theater arts so much. But it's been good to me. I've, um, I've been able to work on all the stages in, um, in the Motherload. Um, here in Calaveras, I've worked over at, um, in Murphy's. Uh, we did Remembrance, which was a stage three play. Um, and uh, I've been at stage three. I've done 30 plays at stage three. Um, since 1991, and um, SRT, I've worked at Sierra Repertory Theater. I've worked in the Bay Area, so I, I you know, I, 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 I've had a really fun, lucrative, you know, career in acting. And have you? You've always done acting. You haven't done any writing or directing or anything like that. No, or? I've done both of those. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Wow. And I, and I love directing. I really do. I didn't think I would as much, but I realized. Um, because when I read a play, just like when I read a book, maybe when you read a book, you can kind of see what the characters look like. You can sort of hear, you know, what they would sound like even. Um, I do that when I read a book. And when I read a play, I definitely go, ooh, you know. So when I was asked to direct one, I went, now I just don't have one part to focus on. I get to kind of, you know, try and see my way through all of these parts and the inner workings of all of these people. Um, so it's, it's actually more fun to direct. Um, and, you know, I'm getting pigeonholed the older I get. I'm only going to be able to play the moms and the aunts and the grandmas. <laughs> no more ingenues for me. <laughs> yeah. I listened to a really interesting uh, interview with a, um, an actor. Um, uh, Frank Langella, I think, is, I'm not really sure how to say it. He was Nixon, Frost Nixon. And he was Dracula. Yeah, and he Langella. was Dracula. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. And he said that, you know, he had such a hard time finding acting jobs all through his career. But when he got older and he kind of got typecast as an older character, he said that's when his biggest success was. That's when everything, like, fell in. Like, he had been, you know, in and out of work his whole life, you know. But that was when it was like now at this age he really, like, is always able to find work, is always able to, you know, have that character. Isn't that so, funny? Yeah. Well, um, it's, yeah, it's a certain type I think people are looking for. A, a really good friend of mine, uh, Lloyd Batista, um, was Frank Langella's, um, what is it called? Not a standby, but... Um, oh, like a stand-in? St um, well, no, if something happened to Frank while he was on Broadway, ah, while he was performing... Understudy. Understudy, there yeah. we are. Um, if something happened to Frank, Lloyd would get to oh yeah yeah and Lloyd said never got sick <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Well, let's jump over to the radio. So what do you do with the radio? You say that you actually work kind of for the three different stations? Oh, no, not all three. Well, oh. Clark Broadcasting um, is home to three radio stations. There's KVML. It's the AM 1450 All Talk All News. Um, then there's two FM stations, and one is um, Country, Today's Country uh, on KKBN. That's 93.5. And then the station that I work on is um, 92.7, Star 92.7. It is an adult contemporary. And I have been there for almost nine years. Started out as, and I had never worked in radio. So again, I have been, I have had some really lucky streaks, lucky breaks. I, I like to think that it's my parents who are not with me anymore and uh, who left me at a fairly young age still looking after their girl, you know? Um, I worked for the morning show. I went from teaching for 14 years mu music and drama at elementary school to all of a sudden being the co-host of the morning show. I went, really? You're going to hire me for that? Cool. How early do I have to wake up? <laughs> This is the coveted position, Marianne. Are you, are you kidding me? Do you know how many people would want this job? I'm like, okay, all right, I'll take it. So I did that for five years. Budget kind of tanked. Um, the economy, I should say, tanked. And um, they took the two full-timers and split us up. So for the past um, almost four years, I've been doing the two till seven um, afternoon, evening slot on Star 92.7 as the, as the DJ. And when you do that, I mean, do you, how much technical stuff do you do? Do you just talk into a mic or do you have to do some of the DJ stuff? Boy, don't DJ I stuff? wish. <laughs> we produce our own show. Yeah. Um, and that was a learning curve that when I was the co-host, I would watch him because he had the whole board. And I was able to have the job that you were, you know, just sit there in my chair with the microphone. <laughs> you know, can I have another cup of coffee, please? No. Uh, and he did. And all the buttons, and you know, someone would phone in, and he'd have the shortcut machine going. And um, so again, I would watch and learn. Um, and every once in a while, he'd go on vacation, and I had to do it. But the poor listener, you know, is hearing two songs at once, and the phone ringing, and me talking to somebody else, you know, or burping. So, uh, <laughs> but having my own show, I have really learned how to ride the game. They call it. You know. Great. Yeah. It's fun, yeah. and it's fun. I do mostly the technical stuff, so yeah. I, and I like it, yeah. too. but it's fun to kind of sit back and be in front of the camera and not have to worry about that if stuff. If I had <laughs> the money and I ended up um, doing voiceovers more and more, and I would, love, I would love to be able to do that. I'd love to be able to someday, you know, even retire and um, be able to still have a studio and do voiceover from my studio, but what I would hire is an editor because... That's what takes the work. The recording of the voiceover, nothing. A lot of times I'll just read it even cold and see if I could get the gist of, of what, you know, the uh, character is trying to, you know, make happen. And then it takes me five times as long to edit out the breaths and the pauses or the pops, you know. It's the editing that takes the time, and I would just say, I would hire. I would hire you, Brandon, because you like the technical. <laughs> well, actually, I don't like editing either for oh. the same exact reason. I love the shoot, but then the editing is like it it's just takes tedious. so so long. And it's fun when it comes all together. You know, you really see the project come together in the editing, but it's a lot, you know, more time consuming sitting in front of a computer. So I know, I know how you feel. So you have your own studio that you record out of. Yes, um, it was something that after. After I started doing the voiceovers, I realized that how convenient would that be? Especially since I happen to have a perfect spot in my home to, to put a studio in. Um, at work, I've got all the wonderful equipment, state-of-the-art equipment, the soundproof booth, and that's all great. And they allow me to use that before my shift or after my shift. So many times I'll stay um, afterward. You know, there's nobody else in the station. Uh, it's nice and quiet, and I'll stay and record, you know, a few auditions, or if I have a couple of jobs, I'll record from there. But I kept thinking, boy, wouldn't it be nice to get it together and have something so on a Saturday afternoon, you know, I can rip off a bunch of voiceovers and send them off, schlep them off, and not have to worry about getting out of my pajamas. 
And so um, I built a room or a studio um, with the help of um, some friends. I mean, I've even had people from the radio stations, the engineers come because, I, you know, I, I ran into a few snafus. I said, what is going on? How come it sounds so, so loud? I had done the insulation that people told me about and I had a really good mic and I had a little interface and um, they came and they went, Marianne, check this out. There was nothing happening in the room. Nobody doing this, nothing. And it was, and there was still the digital readout. And I said, what the heck is that? He said, you know, it could be the hum from the computer. So there's lots of things that could go wrong. And I'm still, it is still not right. I'm, you know, and you have to kind of be a perfectionist. I mean, you're up against a lot of competition when you, a lot of competition when you do voiceovers. And so you, go, you really want to send out something that sounds good quality, um, something that, you know, doesn't sound like you just stepped into a closet with your iPhone and recorded it and sent it out because you're not going to get the job. And do you find that it's, um, I'm guessing you probably aren't buying the most expensive, best equipment. You're kind of doing, a, you know, do it a little bit of a budget, you know, and getting stuff. I mean, do you think that you can get that equipment and still be able to make a really good quality product or? Well, um, not to say that you're cheap or anything. <laughs> well, yeah, well, I, um, I had a budget, and then my sweetheart, who um, he's the one that got the ball rolling, um, Don said, for Christmas, um, I'm going to get you a microphone. Um, and so um, what I did is I went to um, the, store, the, I think, Guitar Center, and I said, I want to check out the highest quality. Go ahead and do top of the line. And... Um, and medium, and what I did is I brought with me an MP3 of what I'm used to hearing from work was what I was used to hearing. So, um, so what I did is I compared, and believe it or not, the highest quality mic that they had, which was I believe five grand, um, wasn't a whole lot, lot, lot better than the middle of the road. Um, it was a lot better, though, than the bottom of the, of the pile. So what I um, did is I went to, I, I just sort of did a little higher grade than middle of the road. And um, then piece by piece, as I said, um, it's nice to have somebody who supports my interest. And he said, no, are you kidding me? This is a great hobby. He says, every birthday, every, you know, every Christmas, I can get you another little component. And so we only really needed about three or four components, you know, headphones. I got headphones for this past Christmas. Like, yay, it was the best <laughs> Christmas present to get. You know, some really good headphones. And if you take your time and you get um, fair to good quality things, you're going to have, I think, the best um, quality MP3 to send out. Yeah, I do the same thing. It's like I buy little things for my video camera equipment and stuff. Now, um, so I'm assuming you use a computer to edit all this stuff and uh, without getting too technical you know what do you what programs do you use to record things and I edit use things? Um, Adobe are you familiar with Adobe yeah. mm -hmm. um, and audition audition um, I guess that's what it's called Adobe audition mm. um, and again anything that I was already familiar with at the radio station is where my comfort zone was and that's kind of where I wanted to stick um, so that's what I, what I did. Uh, the programs that I use at work, I tended to go ahead and buy for my home studio. And uh, it made it just, it made the learning curve easier because I was already used to using that program for editing, for everything. And I even went back, you know, to work and looked at how we have the microphones set up and what presets we have and tried to emulate that on my home microphone, which again, made it, you know, a no-brainer. So, if someone was interested in getting into voiceover or even radio, what would you kind of, you know, suggest to them, or what, what kind of advice would you give to someone who wants to do something like this? Um, first, read, uh, get, some, um, get some demos. There's, there's a lot of free copy that you can get. You don't want to um, steal anybody's, you know, copy, anybody's written words. Um, but there is free um, copy that you can get just through the internet. And um, in fact, I've been trying so hard to 
pull this. I have this friend who has a wonderful, I keep saying, you've got the golden voice. You should really get into this. Uh, I've been trying to get him over to do a demo because that's what it takes. We are our own worst judge of our voices and our, and our everything, you know, uh, whatever we put out. Oh, gosh, I could do better than that. I could do better than that. And so you tend to hate your own voice when you hear it the first time. Um, but if you're wanting to do voiceover, then you're probably wa going to want to play with your range and doing different voices as well. You're doing a little bit of this and, you know, doing old voice and young voice. And so um, that's what I would say is get some copy, read them at home, out loud, several different times, and then um, get someone to um, help you get a, a demo. And it shouldn't cost very much to get a demo because you'll only be in there for a short amount of time. And if they could edit it for you, that'd be wonderful. Put a demo out. And there are agencies. Um, the two that I belong to are Voices.com and Voice123. Um, they allow you to sign up free. You may not get a whole lot of jobs, but you might get a couple, which would be fun. And... Um, but it gets costly if you don't have your own studio. That's, I think, where, you know, um, if you have to start renting a studio, it's like, yikes. It's not worth the 200 or $500 I just made doing this commercial if I have to buy all this equipment. But if you do buy the equipment and you're very serious about it and you go for it, then I would say go ahead and become a premium subscriber because your first job is probably going to pay for um, the subscription that you just paid for for the agency. And little by little, it'll pay for all your equipment. And, uh, you know, and, then, and then it just becomes found money, as they say. <laughs> and I'm sure with those websites, you learn a lot, too. Like, you know, I don't know if you communicate with other people on it, but kind of get you into the industry, at least. So. Well, um, Voices.com, a lot more than, than Voices123, or, yeah, Voice123. Voices.com will actually um, send emails out regularly when you first subscribe, and, um, like, once a week. And they also say, if you want to go to um, this uh, demonstration, you know, there's one in Seattle, and there's one in... Um, so they send out... There's a, a book that they're sending me called voiceovers for dummies. <laughs> That's great. Well, Marianne, thank you so much for coming today. It's been a pleasure to talk to you and I um, uh, really appreciate it. We could go do a whole other show, I'm sure. <laughs> Brandon, thank you so yeah. much for having me and I appreciate the time. Yeah. And thank you for watching Art in the Digital World. Um, we do have a new Facebook page for the TV station. It's on the screen right now, facebook.com slash Calaveras County, Calaveras Community TV. Um, come and check it out. We'll be posting pictures and updates and the schedule and everything. All right, thank you. Have a great day.